thank you for being here this early in the morning on a Saturday. I really appreciate it because you guys are taking, you know, this is a not normally a work day, and you guys are taking advantage of it by coming here. So I thank you so much for that. Is uh, Andre Abramov, Abramov here. Did I get the last name right? No? The only reason I ask is he sent out a tweet. I was going to see if he was here. Here's what I want to do first, though. Uh, by the way, the, there's a bit.ly link you'll see here that gets you access to the slide deck because everyone will say, hey, can I get access to the slide deck? That's the link at the bottom. But I want to do this first. I'm going to start with a quick presentation that looks like this. Because it occurs to me, I've been doing this a long time, and I want to kind of give you guys a little bit of history, if you guys don't mind. If you'll just indulge me with this little experiment I'm about to run here. So this is the computer, or computer like the one I used in 1986 to learn computer programming. So in 1986, I had one of these guys, and we had dual floppies. So I don't know if you guys remember back that long, but dual floppies was that king. There was no hard drive back then. And having dual floppies was a massive win, because you could boot it up with DOS, and then you could remove that floppy and then put in the Pascal, in my case, Pascal compiler, or C compiler, depending on what one you had. And then you had another drive for your data disk, right? So you could store your programs. This was a massive win, so you didn't have to switch out of one all the time. And so this actually started for me in 1986 in a little place called Hawaii. So I actually learned how to program in Hawaii, specifically a little school that looked like this one, OK? Or specifically the Pearl City High School. We were the Chargers. And it was right there, OK? You see that little red dot at the top of the mountain? And actually, let's do this real quick. Let's drill down here, OK? So Pearl City High School is at the top of the mountain of Pearl Harbor, all right? It sits atop Pearl Harbor. And it kind of looks like this, all right? And it's in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Ocean. Hawaii. And so the reason I tell you this story is because I had a very humble beginning. Uh, actually, I grew up with a single mother. My, I was the oldest with three, two, three children. There's two, I had two younger sisters. Had no father. Uh, and basically, my mom moved us back to Hawaii. I was originally born in Hawaii, but also we grew up in the United States, or the main, mainland, as we like to say. And then I went back to Hawaii for high school. And in this case, this is my first foray into learning about computers. And it was specifically because they had no other thing to do with me at the school. They're like, just take this computer class. At that moment in time, in 1986, no one had a clue that computers were going to amount to anything. I'm serious, OK? So you guys are very fortunate to have grown up, if you will, or most of you have grown up with these technologies. And things have changed for you. So let's kind of jump back in here. Oh, stop. All right, let's jump back in here. This is what Hawaii looks like. This is Waikiki. I didn't do too well in math this particular year. I did fine on the computer side of things, but math, I actually had a math class that, out, that looked down at Waikiki and Diamond Head. So it was kind of hard to work. This is what high school graduation looked like. Everyone got lays, specifically the Hawaiian girl on the left. She got more lays than the rest of us, because that's definitely part of their heritage. This is actually a tree from my grandparents' house. This is actually some flowers my uh, grandmother used to grow. These are anthuriums. You might have seen them around here also. They're fairly popular in tropical flower stores. Also orchids she liked to grow. There were some pineapples, obviously. It is Hawaii. And actually, these are some recent pictures from my grandparents' farm. You can kind of see here, it looks like a jungle. And as you can, if you guys aren't getting the sense of this, I'm not so used to the cold. And it's kind of cold here, OK? This is actually uh, uh, five years ago, I went to go see my uncles and my auntie. So you say auntie instead of aunt, auntie and my two uncles. So they're still farming coffee right now. And here's why this is important to me. Certainly, it's part of my heritage. It's my mother's heritage. but those coffee beans, which is from Kona Coffee, paid for my first computer. And it's basically what made my entire career happen over the last several years, or the last three decades. So I just want you guys to think about it a little bit, because again, I come from humble beginnings, and I just simply have now travel the world, and I talk to people about how to do software development. And part of my traveling the world is my giving back to the community at large, one that I gained so much from. So I was, a, I was the Java user group manager, specifically the president of the Atlanta Java user group for many, many years. I started my own conference called DevNexus many years ago. Uh, so conference is about 2,000 people now at this point. And so I've been very plugged into the Java community now for a long, long time. 
So this presentation is supposed to be an inspirational presentation, and it's called Teaching Elephants to Dance. And it's a story of DevOps and digital transformation. So you guys ready? OK. This microphone's kind of noisy, isn't it? Is that a little bit better? OK. So that is the link. You're going to want to check that out later, because we're going to talk about elephants. We're going to talk about the six blind men of the elephant. Hopefully, you've heard this story before. There are six blind men, meaning they have no sight, and they approach an elephant, and they approach it with their hands, right? Because that's how they see. And they basically, one of the blind men will grab a hold of, let's say, the leg of that elephant and go, wow, it's like a tree. It's a trunk of a tree. Another blind man might grab the tusk of that elephant, right? The tusk, and look at it like a spear. Another blind man might actually grab the trunk of that elephant and see it as a snake. And here's the tricky thing about this story that we've heard for many, many years, and maybe it's a popular story that's been presented here in, in Ukraine, I don't know. But the concept is, each of these individuals is right in their context and their perspective. They don't have the whole truth, they just have their truth. And so really, this presentation is fundamentally about helping you guys think about having a different perspective, having greater context about how we do software development in the modern world. Is that fair? OK, so that's one of my elephant stories. Because here's the IT reality we're looking at today. So many people think the elephant in the room, the elephant in the room is the thing we don't talk about, though it happens to be there, is this thing called Java EE. OK, I come from a long history Java background. I came from the JBoss team over a dozen years ago when, before I joined Red Hat uh, about 11 years ago. And so the JBoss team was part of this Java EE universe for a long, long time. But that's actually not really the problem. There's actually another elephant in the room. And this elephant is your lumbering and siloed organization. It is the organization that your company has created, your nonprofit, your state, local, federal government. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a group of people who have created something else that is actually a behemoth and slow. OK? So we're going to talk more about the lumbering and siloed organization than anything else. Now, by 2020, every business will either be digital predator or digital prey. Perhaps you've heard this quote before. Perhaps you've heard the quote that every company is now a software company. And we won't go into that in great detail, but this survey is very powerful. This MIT Sloan survey from just a couple years ago, 2016, 87% of surveyed executives believe digital technologies will disrupt their industries, 87%. Yet only 44% are doing something about it. And only 11% have the in-house talent to do something about it, 87, 44, 11. You folks here in the room today, you represent that 11, OK? So it is incumbent upon us to actually take charge of our destiny and make some magic happen here. Because there are literally millions of software developers on this planet. There's uh, approximately 10 million Java developers. There's approximately 20 million total developers on the planet most of which are you know, not professional software developers, but let's say there's a good 12, 14, 12, 14 million professional software developers. Yet there's only a few people in the room here today. So the thing that's really important that I want you guys to take away from this presentation is that you guys have a challenge as well as an opportunity. You are already the elite. You are already the one percenters of the world. You get paid more than most people on the planet. You have a professional job that most people look at as incredibly nice and comfortable and fun. You get to play with computers all day, and that's exciting. And it should be like that. And that's why I was telling you the story earlier about, you know, 30 years ago I started with a computer, and back then it wasn't a job. It was for fun. That's why we learned how to program computers back then. Now, now it's become a job, and it's a job that pays really well. But we are the few. And we have to be the people who have to kind of make, make it happen for the rest of the world, OK? We are the ones with the digital superpowers who can make something. We are the ones who can create something from nothing. And I want you guys to think about that for one second. How many other people on the planet, of the 7 billion people, can create something from nothing? Yeah, there's people who can wood carve. There's people who can you know, build buildings. But the majority of people can't build anything, OK? Can't make much. And we can actually create the digital technologies that people really want going forward. Now, here's this part of the presentation where I talk about the uh, State of DevOps report. How many people have heard the uh, Puppet Lab State of DevOps report? OK, well, I see one, <laughs> one gentleman over here. 
So the rest of you need to be reading this report on a regular basis. It's phenomenal information. And in this report, where they've surveyed thousands of organizations, they've talked to thousands of companies and the people within it, and they've, what they found is high-performing organizations are decisively outperforming their lower-performing peers. They're outperforming the competition, they're outperforming the world at large by 46 times more deployments. This number was 200, by the way, it dropped. 200 times more deployments the previous year, 46 times more deployments. So think about that. They can go to market 46 times more often than their competition. Can you imagine the time cycle that gives them, right? The ability to learn that much faster. As a matter of fact, it actually leads to 440 sh uh, times shorter lead times. So they are getting to market vastly faster than their competition. They're coming from an idea, the inception of a new product idea or feature or capability, or maybe it's just a bug patch that they have to get out there, and they can deploy it 440 times faster. That leads to great competitive advantage if you think about it. Also, if they do have an issue, they can actually recover 96 times faster. So if there is a bug or a problem or a failure along the deployment pipeline, they can recover from that 96 times faster. So all that leads to what I think of as digital Darwinism. You guys have hopefully heard of the term Darwinism, or of Charles Darwin, and his theory that you know things have evolved over time. And more importantly, uh, if you guys have ever seen the Darwin Awards, which is kind of a joke, it kind of goes around via email, it's basically a very, very interesting ways people have managed to kill themselves. And it sounds horrible, but it's Darwinian in its nature. It's like, look at these people and what they've done to themselves. In this case, I like to think of it from a digital standpoint. So these key principles we're going to tap on very lightly as we go throughout this presentation. We're going to talk a lot about DevOps, and that's really a thing I want you guys to take away from this, but also think in terms of self-service and elastic infrastructure. Can you self-serve, meaning can you help yourself to get what you need for the resources that you want? Do you have some form of automation? And if you notice, I put Kubernetes right there alongside Puppet Chef and Ansible. Typically, Puppet Chef and Ansible are the common configuration management tools. You heard a nice presentation from Paul yesterday, uh, Joyant, who talked about Terraform. There are numerous tools for automation, including a bash shell, if that's what you want. Uh, but I like Kubernetes to do a lot of my automation. And we'll kind of explain a little bit that as we go. Uh, CI, CD, com uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, continuous improvement. There's lots of CIs and there's lots of CDs. You have to decide which ones you want. Uh, we'll talk about deployment pipelines. We'll talk about advanced deployment techniques. And we'll talk briefly about microservices. So let's hop right in. So my, uh, let's talk about DevOps specifically. Here's the ugly reality we're dealing with today. I have this person over here on the left-hand side with their headphones on. They're rocking along with their keyboard. I like to refer to him as the bro-grammar, if that makes sense. Okay. And this individual is basically rocking all along, fixing a bug. They think they're fixing a bug. They run some unit tests in their IDE. They basically say, oh, looks good. They check it in to the source code repository at 4.45 on Friday. This never happens, right? OK, you guys basically say, nope, we work till 6 PM. OK, it's 5.55 on Friday. Basically, right before they walk out the door, they check in the code. And of course, like a good programmer, they head out with their buds to the local pub bar and they have a beer or a shot of tequila or a shot of vodka. And actually, in my case, that wasn't true in, in, in North America and the United States. We take our daughters to soccer practice and we take our sons to baseball practice and we actually go to you know cheerleading or something of that nature. Typically, it's a family event. But let's say that's what this individual does. What they've done is they think they can throw it over the wall to the operations person who has to make your crappy code run. And it might take them all weekend. And here's one thing I want to see change throughout the industry. Because if you remember back when I showed you those pictures of how I learned to program on that old computer back in 1986 on, uh, you know, on Hawaii, think about what it meant to run or write a piece of code and run it. You actually wrote code. You ran it. You were so proud of it, you might have showed your teacher. You might have showed your people on the left hand or right hand of you, hey, look at this. I got it running, the project that they gave me. You might even showed your mama. How many people actually showed their mother their program running the first time when they made one run? OK, the rest of you are, not, are in denial. You did too, OK? You got it working on the Raspberry Pi, or was that Minecraft extension, or whatever it might have been at this day and age. You showed your mother, because that's how proud of you were. And we have to get back to that. We have to get to the point where programmers are running their code again. When we separate the accountability of running code from building code, that's actually where we've uh, failed the entire world. That's why this whole thing is uh, falling apart. 
Because we think we have this scenario right now. The developer is not responsible. They're not accountable. They can just throw it over the wall and hit that poor person in the head. And this is something we have to fundamentally change. OK? Because I want you to keep in mind, your code has no business value until it's deployed. And that's something we have to fundamentally understand. It doesn't matter how many you know, patterns you've used. It doesn't how elegant, matter how elegant it is. It doesn't matter how many cool frameworks you use from open source. Right? I've got Apache Kafka in there now. It's awesome. You know what I'm talking about? It doesn't matter until it's deployed in production and adds real business value. It just doesn't matter. OK, so we must work hand in hand with our operations people. We have to deliver the software package together, carry it over the finish line. If, we, if someone has to stay all weekend, the developer also stays all weekend and owns that component until it actually runs properly in production. And I did this once as a software engineering manager at a previous life, previous job. Uh, we had way too many bugs going in on Friday. Right? Uh, we actually did a weekly deployment. We were in such bad shape. We did weekly deployments with the customer. And if we used to had uh, serious bugs, we all came in on Saturday to work on that. And here was the funniest thing. The quality of the code went way up after we worked a few Saturdays. It just was kind of magical. There was very much fewer bugs on Friday afternoon when we always knew we had to come in Saturday to fix whatever bugs we left in the system. Because accountability matters. You'll drive yourself harder to build a better product if you're accountable. OK. There's more to this, though. Because by 2018, 90% of organizations will fail in their adoption of DevOps if they don't address the cultural challenges that they have. This is according to Gartner. Because it's more than Dev and Ops. It's this whole group of individuals. And if you notice over there, I have this nice uh, you know, zombie person, DBA. I'm not saying the DBA is a zombie or, or the walking dead. What I'm saying is he or she loves the walking dead. OK? And as a matter of fact, our security person there, the security part of the team, they love Star Trek. And while I might love Star Wars, we can have a good conversation about that. Or maybe your QA manager, they love Harry Potter. My point is, we all have some shared common ground to work with these individuals. And here's the most, more important part. We have common ground with everybody. We have to get greater diversity in this software uh, career path. It is fundamentally important that we offer jobs to more people that come from diverse backgrounds than the ones we all come from going forward. That means we need more females, more ladies involved. We need more people of color involved. We need more people with diverse cultural backgrounds. Forget, forget what race or ethnicity or, or gender they come from, but their actual background from a cultural standpoint is critical. We bring all those folks in. And here's the best part. We all watch Big Bang Theory. Or better yet, we all watch Game of Thrones, don't we? And in season seven, right, when those dragons destroyed everything, that was awesome. So we all love it too. OK, now here's what I think about Conway's Law. You can't do a presentation like this without talking about Conway's Law. You guys have heard of Conway's Law before? Here's my interpretation of Conway's Law. Because if you read it, it says, any organization that designs a system will inevitably produce a design whose structure reflects the organization, reflects the organization's communication structure. The problem I have with this Conway's law is he uh, postulated the law with two teams that worked on a compiler, a, three, a, a team of three, or sorry, a three-team architecture produced a three-phase compiler, a four-team uh, four uh, group of people produced a four-phase compiler. And I think that's rather boring, and it was also done like 50 years ago. So it seems like this law is a little bit outdated. So here's how I've modernized it. Maybe you guys have seen this before. This is a game that's often played in the United States. It's probably played here in Ukraine also. And it's where you have a group of people, and they sit around in a little circle. Maybe it's four or five young people, little boys, little girls kind of around the campfire kind of thing. And it's a fun game, because what you do is you make up a story, a very interesting story, and you whisper it to the person on your right or the person on your left. And then they, in turn, whisper it to the next person and then the next person. And by the time it comes all the way back around, the last person gets to tell the story that they just heard. And it's never the same as what the story began as. And so this concept is known as also as Chinese whisperers, or it's known as telephone. And here's what it looks like in software development. So my developer on here, on this chart, has to refer to their team lead. They've got to get their team lead to do something. They got to talk, that team lead has to talk to their manager. The manager has to talk to the vice president of development. 
The vice president of development plays golf with the vice president of operations. That's how they communicate, okay? Who then talks to his or her manager, who talks to their team lead, who then talks to the operations person. And it might look something as silly as this. This person out here says, hey, I'm a developer. I want uh, Java 8. I want a, you know, bug fixes. Um, there's certain bug fixes in the version of Java 8 that I need. Uh, for instance, if you're familiar with the presentation I do around Docker and the Java virtual, uh, Java virtual machine and the memory it uses, there's a, there's a fix in there in Java 8. I want that. Uh, there's also something around lambdas. I think lambdas would be cool. I should take advantage of that. And you talk about that with your team lead. They get it. They're close enough to the tech. They go, oh, yeah, Java 1.8. It's got good stuff in it. All right? Look what happens as you go further up the chain. Upgrade Java is what they hear. And that's painful. Upgrade Java bugs, as a matter of fact, because you know, they're not quite paying attention. And Lambas, they don't know what a Lamba is. And check this one out. Once you get up to the vice president, they're definitely thinking they're upgrading some bugs. And Lembas bread, you guys know the elven bread from, uh, you know what I mean? So this person over here goes, upgrade Java? OK, well, I don't know about that. What the, you know? They, this person knows exactly what happened they upgraded Java last time. It caused major systems outages, right? How about this one? Okay. Damn devs want Java upgrade or something about buggy sheep. <laughs> but this is what it looks like. And, and here's the best part. The operator goes, I've heard of that sheep bug before. But this is the problem that we have. And so our solution to it to solve this problem is ticketing, right? We filed tickets. And we filed tickets upon tickets upon tickets upon tickets. And eventually, two or three vice presidents approved the ticket. And two months later, something happens. And because the ticketing system is simply a way for it to cover our own ass. It's a way to have plausible deniability. It's a way to pass the buck in a, formula, uh, a formal way. And that's what the ticketing system is for. And that's, of course, not really what we're talking about in terms of DevOps. And of course, this org chart is simplified, but there's the enterprise architecture team that gets involved, the project management, uh, product management, security compliance team, all these different parties play a part. OK, so when restructuring teams yields better results, it fundamentally proves that software development is mostly a communication problem. And that's what I love about DevOps so much. And we're living in a post-Agile world. Have you guys heard that before? So Agile, which came out in 2001, 2002, you know, the Agile Manifesto is when XP and all that got super exciting, right? X extreme programming, 1999. It didn't actually solve the problems that IT was encountering. You know, we created this thing called Water Scrum Fall, is how people refer to it. We still have big upfront planning. And this happens even within Red Hat, the organization I work for. I just sat through a planning meeting last night. Let's plan for the next 14 months, is exactly what we did. And so then at some point, you know, you have your little scrum teams work on those plans over the course of the next 14 months or so. And then you have some sort of big bang deployment, which could take three to six months, depending on what you've done. And the best part about that, let's say, 24-month time window is the world has changed while you were doing all that. Things have changed. The business uh, context has changed. Com competition has changed. So this concept of communication is super critical as we go forward. And we think as software developers, we don't have to communicate. Right? We basically will go into our little rooms. People will slide pizza under the door. Right? Pot of coffee comes in. Code comes out the other end. That's not the way it works in the world anymore. We have to communicate and we have to work with each other. Because this is what software development probably looks like in a lot of organizations. Maybe it doesn't in yours. But I can tell you, I just did the same presentation to a whole lot of big banks in New York City. And a lot of people saw this and were like, yeah. Okay. Because if you've ever heard the story of pushing the boulder uphill, pushing the rock uphill, it's hard. It's hard to push the rock uphill, but it can be done. A rock has structural integrity. It can be moved. This is what we're doing in modern software development and delivery. We have this big amorphous blob that people aren't sure what it is. It's not highly modular. We don't know what quite it looks like. And there's all this gang of individuals pushing and shoving, trying to move it along as fast as they can. And the best part is, what's this person doing over here? And you're probably thinking, if you're a developer, oh, that's the operations people. They're always saying no. And as a matter of fact, I would say it's not the operations people, it's more the DBA. And I pick on the DBA not because uh, they're actually that 
tricky, but I've actually had a lot of conversations with software developers over the years. Now, I was having a presentation to a group about this size, and it was an open discussion, and finally someone said, you don't understand, Burr, we can't do anything in our organization because the DBA will never let us change the schema. It takes, we only change the schema once every four to six months. And that's, you know, after they decide they're going to have a whole weekend of downtime to do it. And I finally said, well, how, when's the last time you actually took your DBA to lunch? Or bought him or her a drink? And it was done silence. You have to keep in mind that that DBA loves Game of Thrones also, okay? You have common ground. You have something to talk about. You should take them to lunch and spend time with them. And I've even been in organizations where they physically have siloed people. So it's one thing to have organizational silo, meaning people within an org chart, but they even moved the other people to the other side of the room, or better yet, to another floor in the building. Operations is way over there. DBA is way over there. Project, product management is way over there. Engineering is over here. QA is over that way. Or better yet, QA is over in some other country. And that's just not going to work long term. That's not, the, that's not what DevOps is all about. How about this person up here? You're probably thinking, oh, that's the architect. <laughs> They're trying to ride on top of this thing. How about this person down here on their back? That's actually your operations person. Trying not to be crushed under the weight of this big blob you've created. Trying to keep it afloat. Trying to keep it alive. Because here's what it looks like going forward. Let's say we managed to make it up that hill one time. Grand, big ceremony. We pulled it off. We got everyone signed off. We made it happen. It was painful. We had people working all weekend long. And then we got to do it again and again. And this is why you don't do it but every three months. Or you don't do it but every four months. Because it sucks. And we need to make software more humane. As a matter of fact, we need to make software delivery look like this. Small teams working together, pushing in the same direction on a nicely modular piece of software that everyone can get their head around. Everyone knows what it looks like. It may not be perfectly round. It might not roll perfectly, but at least we know how to get it over the hump. Okay? All right. That's enough about DevOps. Let's talk about a couple of the other things on this evolutionary chart that I have here. There's a test I like to ask people. It may not apply in this group here. But I can tell you, just this week when I was up at a different, I was in Poland, I'll just tell you that. I was in Poland, I asked this question, and people were laughing out loud. I said, how many weeks does it take to get a virtual machine in your organization? And so you might have heard this yesterday as someone else asked the question, how long does it take for you to push Hello World to production? That's one test. That's an interesting test by itself. For instance, we found when we surveyed organizations, it takes them probably 30 to 35 days to ship Hello World. One line of code change takes 30 days to ship. In this case, this is just purely a different issue. How, long, how many days or weeks does it take to get a virtual machine? If you need a computer as a software expert, an IT professional, how many weeks does it take to get a computer? In a lot of organizations, it's three weeks or more. And you're probably thinking, my organization, Pooh, we do it fast. We do it in a week or two weeks. I've had other places, literally, they said this, this past week, I was with a group of people, they're like, hey, Burr, six weeks around us. We do it in six weeks. And I had another group say six months. So think about that for one second. If you are a home builder, you build houses, and someone told you you can't have nails or hammer or saw for three weeks, could you do your job well? Could you do your job effectively? Yet we expect IT professionals not to have access to computers for three weeks at a time. That just makes no sense. And here's the more important part of it. Here's the more insidious part. When, when people aren't giving you the tools you need, what signal does that send you? What does that tell you when the boss can't pull this off? It basically says your time's not that valuable. And it might be a subtle subconscious thing, but that's exactly the signal you're receiving. My time is not that valuable if I'm waiting around for a freaking computer, okay? So think about that for a second. Self-service also means no ticketing. What we've done in many organizations is like, okay, we solved the problem. If you need a virtual machine, you file a ticket with this organization, you define your configuration, you get all that information documented, and then, of course, you send it to the next person up the food chain who goes up the food chain and gets up to your vice president who agrees, yes, you can have a, vice, you can have a virtual machine, all right? And eventually, out the other end of that queue comes the thing that you wanted. It turns out it wasn't quite right. <laughs> but that's OK. We at least have our ticketing system in place to validate that we did all the proper procedures. The ticketing system is simply a way for people to hide behind something 
and say, no, it wasn't my problem. The ticket went to them, or the ticket went to them. That's all it is. An organization that relies on their ticketing system and where to place blame is an organization that's going to fail going forward. OK? All right, let's talk about automation quickly. Have you guys heard the term Phoenix server? How many of you have heard the term Phoenix server or Snowflake server? Only a few, OK. OK, just I noticed this gentleman over here holds his hand up a lot. But <laughs> OK, the concept of, of the Snowflake server, and I see this a lot. And I actually found, I thought about this before I realized it was a term. I was sitting with customers uh, at a Red Hat event. And Red Hat has organizations. We have the Global 2000, right? We have big organizations that are our customers. And they have hundreds, if not thousands, of servers. So I, was, I just happened to sit down at a lunch table at an event. And I said, so hey, what, what do you do? Oh, I'm a you know, senior Linux systems administrator. I have all these Red Hat Enterprise Linux systems. I said, how many do you have? One, this gentleman, he goes, I've got about 250. And the lady sitting right beside him, she goes, I've got about 350. So they, between the two of them, they had you know, 600 servers that they had to manage. And that was by themselves. Then they had other people on the team that had their own 50, 100, 200 servers they managed. And then there, and I said, so what was the most amazing thing that you heard about in this conference, this presentation? They're like, well, the IKEA story. And I'll tell you the IKEA story in a second, the people who you know, build furniture. They said, that was amazing, that IKEA story. And I said, why? They said, because they were able to fix all those servers so fast. I said, that's easy. It's all automated, right? They're like, no. We can't actually, we don't even know if we can reboot our servers successfully after applying a patch. And I was pretty amazed by that. So it turns out the snowflake looks like this. You basically take a 1U rack mountable server, you slam it into the rack, OK? You basically give it a power cable and an ethernet cable. Sometimes you can do everything over ethernet, but most people give it power and ping. And then basically it pixie boots the operating system and loads it on. And then someone SSHs in and basically yum install this, yum install that, app get this, app get that. And they've tweaked system D in at D. And they have a server with all the services they want running on it. And they get out of there and they go about their business. That's the snowflake. It's unique. It wasn't built by a script. And it wasn't built by a central source of configuration. The concept of the Phoenix server is different. The Phoenix server says, I can burn that server to the ground, literally physically destroy it, and remake it from nothing because I have a nice script or a nice configuration management recipe or in my case, maybe an Ansible playbook that will actually bring it back to life in exactly the way it's supposed to be. That also means I can apply patches to it programmatically. I have everything codified in a source control. I know exactly what that server is supposed to look like at any given point in time. So that's critical. OK, let's keep marching along here. Here's these, this guy. His name is Jez Humble. If you've not seen any of his presentations, he's got numerous ones on YouTube. I've watched several different ones. And I really love his content. He's the fellow who helped write this book called Continuous Delivery. And he offers these basic tests. So let's actually try it with this audience. How many people here use some form of continuous integration in their organization? Continuous integration like Jenkins or Team City? OK, see, all, most hands go up, right? OK, for those of you who just raised your hands, I hope you're not using email as your source control system. Okay. And, and that's, I know it's, some people are snickering because you're like, oh, that project over there still uses email for source control. You know what I'm talking about. You email the system back and forth as a zip file, and that's how it gets versioned. Okay? It, it shouldn't happen anymore, but it still does. So Jez offers these basic tests. So for those of you who raised your hands, I want you to think about it for a second. Is your software and trunk always deployable? And for a lot of people, they're like, yes, it's always deployable. And then the next bullet often gets them. The next one is, are you allowing everyone to check in the trunk daily? And so in that same uh, Puppet Lab State of DevOps report, we talk about the fact that there should be no long-lived feature branches, no more than a day. And so for people who are like, oh, my trunk is pristine, it's because no one can check into it. And they have feature branches that last weeks, if not months. And the problem with that is, that's not continuous integration. That's every now and then integration. Continuous integration says you integrate always, continuously, now, not when that feature branch is ready three or four weeks from now, as an example. Also, if the build breaks, it's such a critical issue, it'll be fixed in 10 minutes. We will stop everything to fix the build. And better yet, if we have to hire a new engineer and bring them onto this project, we will onboard them in less than a day. We know exactly how to configure a developer workstation, so they're up and running immediately. Now, so can you guys pass those tests? Those are much harder. 
And I can tell you in a lot of organizations I've talked to, yeah, these things don't apply. So here's really what the bottom line is. If you can't pass these basic tests that Jez talks about here, you're not actually doing the practice of config, uh, continuous integration. You're simply using a config, continuous integration tool. You're using Jenkins as a tool. You're not actually uh, adhering to the practice. OK. The job of deployment pipeline is to prove that a release candidate is unreleasable. Unreleasable. The presumption is that everything checked in the trunk is always releasable. And that's a different way of thinking about it. OK. So let's talk a little bit about pipelines and deployment techniques. This is the IKEA story I mentioned. The IKEA story is pretty interesting because when shell shock happened, if you guys have heard of shell shock, which is a major critical vulnerability, CVE, right? Critical vulnerability and exploit. They came out for the Linux operating system. They were able to fix that across 400 different uh, sites, across 400 continents, thousands of servers in a few hours. They were to roll a patch out basically instantly globally at the IKEA store. You guys know you guys have one across the street, as an example. OK? So that's a very interesting story. I'll let you go read that. There was also another one called Heartbleed that happened not too long ago. And I bet there's people that you guys are working with today, customers you consult for, organizations you work with then, that still have Heartbleed in production today because they don't know how to patch it or they're afraid to patch it. OK? You might be thinking, is it the only operating, is it just the operating system that's the problem? And it's not. It's the full stack of capabilities. OK? So it's the operating system, the JVM. If you're a Java developer, like my, my people are, if you will, that's what I do. It could also have a critical vulnerability. Or better yet, the frameworks that I use, whether that be Spring or Struts or Hibernate, could have a critical vulnerability. I actually built this slide based on a zero-day uh, CVE meaning zero day means you have zero time to prepare. As soon as you know about the bug and the world hears about the bug, hackers are already exploiting it. And that was true of this one back in uh, last year. This is a 2016 issue. And it turns out it was a massive problem over this past summer. And uh, what is it, something like half of United States citizens lost their data recently because of this same issue. And it just wasn't patched. So how do you deal with that? So in the DevOps world, that same Puppet Lab State of DevOps report, high performers spend 50% less time fixing and remediating security issues. And they might have something that looks like this. This is a blue-green deployment, and here's my deployment pipeline. I check in my code into the source control repository, hopefully not email, hopefully something like Git or maybe an SVN if that's what we have. It does an immutable image build. Maybe it's an AMI or a Docker container. And it gets pushed through the deployment pipeline, hopefully in an automated fashion. But if not, it can be done manually. And it lands in production. And you can see right now in production, blue is the active one. It lands on green. And what happens is we change the router from blue to green. And if there's a failure, we switch it back to blue. And if we're not doing this today, we should be. If you're dealing with a Kubernetes architecture, let's say, OpenShift architecture, this sort of thing is dead easy. It's built into the architecture. You get rolling updates for free, and you get stuff like this basically for free. It's easy. Now, if you're living in an older architecture, let's say pre-virtualization, pre-Amazon, pre-cloud, yeah, it is harder. You have to have, let's say, a really cool big IPF5 router, and you've got to have someone who knows how to wield it, knows how to script it. We're going to keep talking about some of these things, though. Let's talk about canary deployments. So blue-green is all or nothing. It's all blue or all green. 100% of the traffic goes either way. Then we have the concept of the canary deployment. This is a story that came out of Kentucky and the United Kingdom, out of England. So Kentucky, not too far from where I live. And the concept was that the coal miners would take a little bird in a cage, a little yellow bird, down into the coal mine. Because the bird would offer two services to those coal miners. It would sing, giving them entertainment, or it would fall off its perch dead if there was any kind of poisonous gases. Because it turns out the canary was more sensitive to poisonous gases than the human. And if the canary fell off the perch, you need to get the hell out of the coal mine. Same thing applies here in canary deployments. The idea is you take a small build, a small package, an immutable image, maybe let's say a Docker image as an example. You push it through your deployment pipeline. You drop it into production, maybe on my blue production environment here. And I just route a little bit of traffic to it. Not all my users, some of my users. And then we can basically send traffic to it, growing it over time until it fills every user's needs. If at any given point there's a problem, 
any kind of statistical variance doesn't look quite right, CPU, memory, you know, users are not happy, we bail out and we basically roll back or roll forward. All right? We got a, we're almost running out of time here, but a couple more points to cover. Sometimes the best code is no code. And I really like this point right here. There's a fellow named Kohavi who did a lot of research around experimentation at Amazon, and then went on to do it at, at Microsoft, specifically around the Bing service, so you know, a very large service. And he wrote this paper, and he found that basically only a third of the code that you write offers real value. So think about that for a second. A third of all the work that you've done offers real value at the end of the day. So if we could figure out what that one-third was and eliminate the other two-thirds of our work, we'd be partying, wouldn't we? We'd be a lot more productive. And so I like this concept. If you must code, first do no harm. And here's the real thing in this space. What is your hypothesis? We always start our projects with requirements. You guys hear that term all the time, right? I was a product manager at Red Hat for over a decade. And people were always like, Burr, what's your requirements? Engineers would come to me, Burr, what are the requirements? And I hated that word. It's like I was the smartest person in the room, and I can make up things that are absolutely required? No. I don't know any more than you know, Mr. Engineer. Why can't you help me think through what the next best thing to do is? And I always tried to work with the engineering team to basically solve that problem. What is the next right thing to do? And in this case, what is your hypothesis? And so maybe here's an example of an A-B test. So I might decide that on my BE variety, so I have a, a stable environment, and then I have a B variant, right? The, all I've done is move the button up. I might think that actually produces better business results for my iOS users in Ukraine or my Android users over in Poland, where I just was. I believe that'll produce better business results just by moving that button, better conversions. Or better yet, I dislike the fact that these are very UI-oriented examples. What about a business logic example? The UI is the same, but what I've done is I've mapped a whole new piece of code out there for the recommendation engine. I've fundamentally changed the recommendation engine, and I can offer different recommendations to that user. And it turns out maybe one variant works better than the other. Another example here is one of my favorites, because uh, I specifically worked with an organization when I drew these pictures, and they were talking about their mobile e-commerce. And one of the theories, you know, I make stuff up. It's like, what if I just show you where the product is physically near you right now? And you could go to the store and buy it. I think that would be very powerful. But you don't know until you have a hypothesis and you experiment with it. OK? All right, so we're almost done now. You can see these are the stages we talked about very quickly. There's a lot more we could do here, and there's a lot of demos we could do to show you many of these things. As a matter of fact, there's a nice A-B session coming up later today. Uh, and I've seen several good presentations from the Wix team already. So you guys are doing a good job by being here, being engaged, showing up on Friday, showing up on Saturday, and you guys are already down this path. You're already down this evolutionary journey. So if you move pretty far down that path, I would contend that you can actually make a monolithic application deploy as fast as one, one time a week. We've seen that already. There's two links here that actually document a bank, a banking system that actually produces a monolith every week, or in the case of Basecamp, the guys at 37 Signals, they can ship their monolith every week. And so what if you have to go faster than once a week? Because that's still not fast enough. I've got to go faster than once a week. Well, you can either get a bigger office or get a smaller elephant. And so let's talk quickly about microservices. It started with XP was when we actually wanted to think about how we would make at, uh, software development teams faster, move along faster. We crafted the Agile Manifesto in February 2001. That's when X, uh, XP Days was born, right, 2001? You're probably thinking, no, Mikolai wasn't born back then. But that's OK, right? It started early. Uh, you can also think of the cloud happening in 2006, DevOps in 2009. See, these terms are old. Java E6, the last major edition of Java E was 2009, all right? Netflix moves to Amazon 2010. You see that Drop Wizard was born in 2011. Ribbon is open sourced. Hystrix is open sourced 2002. Eureka, uh, sorry, 2012. Eureka 2012. Microservices defined in 2012 and 2014. And you can see where Docker and Spring Boot are born and Kubernetes. So we've been thinking about the space we're in now for a long, long time. And things have fundamentally changed. And Netflix changed all of it for us. OK, but let's show you this. As of 2015, this is what your microservices platform might have looked like. And actually, as of 2016, you can eliminate several pieces of that architecture. OK, 
because Kubernetes, or OpenShift, or Re OpenShift is specifically Red Hat's enterprise-supported version of Kubernetes. We're the second largest contributor to Kubernetes outside of Google themselves. And so you don't need a ribbon. You don't need a Eureka. You don't need a config server from Spring anymore. But you still need Zipkin and Zool and Hystrix as of 2016. As of 2017, it's going to be open tracing and Jaeger from the Uber team, eliminating Zipkin. And as of 2018, you eliminate the rest with something called Istio. You're going to hear a lot about Istio going forward in service meshes. OK? All right. And nice thing about this is, with this new architecture, you can fundamentally make it polyglot now. It's not a spring-only architecture like it was just a couple years ago. It can be for Python, or Node, or C-sharp, or Go, or any other application programming environment framework tool that you want, because it all is inside the infrastructure now. There's one elephant in the room we should mention. If you want to do all this microservices stuff, you have to fundamentally change your monolithic database model. These, we have written a book that specifically talks all about how to deal with our strategies, how to deal with a monolithic database to move into a microservices world. There's a bunch of other books available to you. I mentioned that first link, right? There's a bunch of other links in here, including some training on uh, how to do microservices, things like that. And then, please remember, it's about helping your organization win. It's about the winning of the team, not the winning of the individual. Focus on that team, this group of individuals who are going to work together, deliver something better and awesome, and deliver better business value faster. It's more about delivering business value than it is about delivering code. Think about continuous improvement. Always be accountable. These are the books you should be reading at this point. These books are fantastic. And of course, there's the Lean Startup in here also, but Lean Enterprise is the follow-on to that. Phoenix Project Continuous Delivery DevOps Handbook. Also, the State of DevOps Report is absolutely fantastic. Always read the ThoughtWorks uh, report as well that comes out every so many months, you know, and this, you basically what they see the market looking like. And there's links in this document also. And I want to leave you with this last quote. How many people know the name Viktor Frankl? Only one person. And actually, when I was in Poland, it didn't occur to me. Uh, that's where he was interred, or whatever you call it, right? That's where he was imprisoned. Viktor Frankl is very famous for having been a Holocaust survivor. Okay? He lost most of his family in the Nazi concentration camps. His wife, his mom, right? I think only his sister lived. His brother died, too. And he generated this amazing philosophy coming out of there. And he went on to be a you know, psychiatrist, psychologist. And so he has numerous amazing quotes. Some of them are absolutely, these, the kind of things you teach your children kind of stuff, OK? <laughs> There's some really good stuff in there. This is one of my favorites, though. When we are no longer able to change a situation, and he came to this philosophy in very harsh conditions, when you can't fix anything, when someone completely owns you, and you're just their slave, you can always choose how to change yourself. And the other famous quote he has is, you can choose to change your attitude. At the end of the day, if you have no other choice, you can change yourself and you can change your attitude. And I think that's absolutely amazing. And it's fundamentally what drives me forward every day. And I hope it actually resonates with you and this audience also, because I think it is profound and it can teach us all something. So I thank you guys all so much. The slides are available at that link again. And I'll be available afterwards, but I hopefully you guys found something inspirational and interesting in this talk. And again, I thank you so much for being here, and I really, really appreciate being here in Kiev. And uh, you guys go off and have an awesome day here for Saturday XP Days. Thank you.